scripture reading this morning comes to us from Isaiah, chapter 61. We are focusing on verses 1 through 4, and then 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing will faithfully give them the recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all of the nations. In C.S. Lewis's beloved tale, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the reader encounters four Londoner children who were spirited away to safety in the country during the Blitz of World War II. For reference, the Blitz is when the Luftwaffen, the Nazi Air Force, began a bombing campaign against London and other metropolitan areas of the United Kingdom in order to cripple the British war machine. The four children are sent to safety in the English countryside, and they go to stay with a studious professor who owns a sprawling old home. Naturally, boredom sets in soon after the children arrive, and they begin to look for ways to entertain themselves. They peruse the library and read. They play some board games. But there's only so many times you can do these things before the boredom creeps in, and it feels like time begins to go backwards. During a rainy day, the children decide to play a game of hide-and-seek. And now the youngest Pevensey child, their last name is Pevensey, it's a young girl by the name of Lucy. And whilst one of her elder siblings are counting to 100, she runs throughout the estate and she finds a hiding spot in a wardrobe in a forgotten corner of the manor. While she's hiding, she notices it's kind of cold in here. She notices there's snow on me. I smell a fir tree. Oh, look, there's a passage to another world in the back of this wardrobe. Lucy steps into Narnia, a beautiful land that's been trapped under the spell of an eternal winter. While Lucy is meandering around in this brand new world, she encounters a fawn by the name of Mr. Tumnus, and he tells her that in Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. When she asks why, she learns that a white witch has placed a curse upon this land to make it so. Aslan, the lion who led Narnia during more prosperous, peaceful times, hasn't been seen for ages. All of Narnia's inhabitants live in fear or despair or frozen rock solid by a curse. The days of warm summers, flowing rivers, and merrymaking are but distant memories for those fortunate enough to recall them. Ker Pavarel, the castle by the sea, where Narnia's rulers of old once reigned from, sits covered in vines of darkness. Narnia 
It's quite literally in a state of enforced hopelessness. A state where things are, but not as they should be. Unbeknownst to Lucy, her brother Edmund has also followed into this strange land through the wardrobe. As he's attempting to find Lucy, not really understanding what's going on around him, his only idea is to catch his sister and scare her or do something else to torment her. While he's out wandering around in Narnia, he encounters the one being who has made Narnia the way that it should, or the way that it is, not the way it should be. He meets the infamous White Witch, and upon learning that he is a son of Adam, in other words, human, the witch makes her usual iciness and her harsh nature. She switches that all up and she decides, he's got something I want, I'm going to be nice to him. She bribes Edmund with Turkish delight, conjured by magic, in order to get information out of him. At this time, Narnians would believe that their present bleak reality is all that there's ever going to be in life. That's what the wa witch wants them to believe. She wants them to be afraid. It is this way because I say so, and it always will be this way. However, the witch also knows, on the other side of that brute force and manipulative will, that her reign of death, her reign of ice and frost, has an expiration date. If she's seeing a human child out and about in the wilderness of her realm, she also knows there's more. He's not the only one. She knows that more can appear, more can show up in Narnia, more can show up to fulfill an ancient prophecy which spells her end. She knows at this moment her adversary is on the move. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown made of shards of ice. Now, before sending Edmund on his way, she commands that he return to his family and convince them to come join her in Narnia. Why, you may be wondering? Well, like I said, these children appearing means that the old magic will awaken and her power, her power to control, her power to end life, her power to freeze things the way that they should not be, it means that will end. So in her mind, she needs to stop them before they can stop her. She needs to stop the great lion Aslan from returning because his return spells her immediate end. In other words, these four children, unbeknownst to them, step into a world, a world of prophecy. They step into a world where they play a part that they don't really know exactly what it entails. Eventually, all four Pevensey children enter Narnia, and the prophecy is set in motion. Narnians begin to come alive in ways that haven't been seen in generations. Things begin to thaw. The whispers of Aslan is on the move. They're hushed, yes, but they're ringing with hopefulness in this tundra. This is a hope inspired by truth and expectation of what is to come not wishful thinking. Through all of this, Edmund, however, still retains some loyalty to the White Witch. Whilst the children are traveling together as a group of four, he sneaks away and he goes to her, thinking he's going to be welcomed. He got them to Narnia, he's back now. He's going to be welcomed like a prince, returning home. In reality, the witch's true nature is displayed and she doesn't feel bad about it at all. He showed up after all. Who cares if I treat this child poorly? The three remaining Pevensies make their way to Aslan. Fearing that their brother Edmund is lost forever, they seek the lion's help. They know, even though they don't know the specifics, they know that Aslan has a plan. Aslan has a way to get Edmund back. Aslan always has a plan. And as the three remaining Pevensey children venture closer to Aslan in the meeting place, they notice not only is there a thaw 
in Narnia. The snow is melted. There are signs of life everywhere. They even run into Santa Claus and Narnia for the first time in eons. These children coming to Narnia amidst an eternal winter seemed so random to the reader, and yet this is all aligning according to what was foretold. Kind of similar to our text today and the Israelites returning to their ancestral home. Eventually, all of the invested parties meet in a clearing. By now, the snow is completely melted and the witch's grasp on Narnia is in name only. When the witch tries intimidation and scare tactics, they backfire splendidly in her face. The witch cruelly reminds the gathered crowds that Edmund, he's hers. Aslan takes her aside to speak alone and see what can be done. In her mind, he is hers, she has claimed him. There is nothing that could be given in his place. Later that evening, Susan and Lucy, the two Pevensey daughters, can't sleep, so they decide to get up and take a little walk and try and locate Aslan. As luck would have it, he also happens to be awake and was pacing the camp as well. When the girls ask where he's going, he doesn't really answer them, but he says, you can follow me at a distance, but do not be seen, do not be heard. They follow him for a little while and they come upon a clearing where the witch waits for Aslan alongside an army of dark and corrupted minions. Next to the witch is a great stone table for sacrifice. This is a table, as I said, that are, is for sacrificing and it's made to appease unseen deities. It's made to appease old magic. It's made to appease that which seemingly thinks it has a hold. A sacrifice must be made this night, and a ransom must be paid. Aslan, the great leader, the lion, the warrior, offers himself as a sacrifice, as a place for Edmund. Failing to see the bigger picture at work here, the witch gleefully accepts the downfall of her biggest enemy, and she gets to do it herself. The witch embodies death, an icy hand which strikes the breath from the living without so much as a second glance. As she drags Aslan upon the stone sacrificing table and starts shaving off of his mane to humiliate him, in his final moments she says to him, and now who has won? Fool, did you think that by all of this you would save the human traitor? Now, I will kill you instead of him as our pact was, and so the deep magic will be appeased. But when you are dead, what will prevent me from killing him as well? And who will take him out of my hand then? Understand that you have given me Narnia forever. You have lost your own life, and you have not saved his. In that knowledge, despair and die. With final words meant to seal hopelessness in eternity, death takes what it thinks is its final stab. Death meant to crush all who stand in its way, indiscriminate in the ruin that it creates. It's dark, it's cold, it's hopeless. There is no light, there is no warmth, there is no growth. All seems lost. The body of the mighty lion lies broken and cold upon a stone table. And all of this to ransom the life of one snot-nosed bratty kid. Well, yes. The story is far from over, even though it seems to have succumbed to death's finality in this moment. The next morning, dawn breaks over the stone table. The stone table itself cracks in two, right down the middle, and the body of Aslan is nowhere to be seen. 
The White Witch, thinking her job is done, has gone on the move with her armies to finally conquer Narnia, believing Aslan to be out of her way forever. But from the ruins of death, Aslan rises. Amidst the destruction and rubble where death has so proudly swept in and ended life, life and love rear their head and roar. Hope roars. Eternal hope is one that cannot be extinguished or snuffed out. In our text today that I read a little bit ago, we encounter Israelites who know this condition so well. Most scholars attribute our passage to a time that the Israelites were several uh, generations into an exile in the faraway land of Babylon. And while these Israelites in particular weren't the ones who were forcibly driven from their homes by invading armies, they carry the generational stories and the generational scars and the generational trauma imbibed in them from their ancestors who lived this. For decades, the Israelites lived in a foreign land with little to no hope of returning to Israel. Through successive empires, wars, and changes of power, a time, however, does come to the Babylonian exiles. A time that says, you're going home. A home that has long since been lost. According to the wisdom of the day, it was a home that was lost nonetheless by a corrupt and sinful way that was Israel's past. You see, towards the final days of the southern kingdom, it was said that the sinfulness of the people caused the glory of God to physically leave King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. God's presence was so overwhelmed by the sinful nature of humanity that God said, I'm out, leaving God's chosen people exposed and vulnerable. Without the presence of God, it meant that God's people, like I said, were not only vulnerable, but especially vulnerable to attacks from surrounding kingdoms. According to the account, God's withdrawal of favor meant that the ways of corrupt kings and failed military campaigns led to the northern kingdom first being wiped out by the Assyrian armies. And then the southern kingdom soon followed the same fate being wiped out by the Babylonians. And yet, biblical accounts throughout all of this turmoil, throughout all of this violence and loss, still call the people to repentance for their wicked ways and to remember God's promises to God's people. Hope still lingers among the muck. Hope of a return to their long lost homeland still clings like a pinky swear promise. If you don't know what that is, ask your children or grandchildren, these are legit. By the time of our passage's writing, Jerusalem sat in ruins and didn't resemble the ancestral home. But did that stop them from hoping? Did that stop the remnant, the exiles in Babylon from hoping? No. Even though God's people were wayward and were forced from their homes, God's promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. It may take a while in human terms to get where we're going, but that doesn't mean we do this alone. That doesn't mean we walk through the fire alone. Much like Narnia had been transformed and made void of life, so too was the southern kingdom of Judah. When the Israelites are finally permitted to return home by the Persian emperor Cyrus, they do find their ancestral home, but it's ruined. It is beyond recognition. And yet, they carry all of the hopes of their ancestors who would never see this blessed homeland. They are the fulfillment of God's promises to God's people during the exile. No, it doesn't look exactly the way ancient prophecies imagined that it would, but God still makes it happen. Upon seeing their homeland laid waste, it is easy to imagine many of them saying, this isn't what I hoped for. This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I listened to story after story after story of my ancestors telling me. But the thing is, hope is hope. 
You can't change that even if you yourself have become cynical. Hope remains. Hope in God's promises means accepting the challenging reality of what is in front of us, but not letting it define us. Hope in the Lord isn't some vain attempt to put a smile on things in the hope that it'll somehow get better. We have unshakable hope in the Lord because God says to us, I am with you. Even when you feel like you've strayed so far and you feel so alone, I'm there. I'm with you. I love you. Remember, before Abraham was, I am. Yesterday, today, and forever. Let that be your reminder. J. Alec Montier says of the Israelites' restoration, the picture, of course, is the return from Babylon to face the task of reconstruction. The reality is the new life into which the anointed one will bring his people, bringing with it powers of reconstruction to mend every past breakdown, no matter how long standing, whether it be ancient or generational. The Pevensies of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe stumbled into a strange, barren land. They, through everything, held on to the goodness and hope that restored Narnia. The returning exiles grabbed each ruin and bit of rubble, knowing what they built upon would be entirely new, yet at the same time, kind of all too familiar. The new, much like the old, is done with God's help and for love of God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. As fortune or life or whatever you would call it would have it, modern Palestine currently finds itself under ruin and rubble. Now about to enter its second year of war, about 25% of Ukraine shares the same fate. So what do we, the body of the risen Christ, do? How do we bring God's light and love amidst humanity's ruins so that all things can be made anew? During this season of hope and expectation we call Advent, we may even ask ourselves yet again, can we do anything? Yeah. Yeah, we can. We can maintain hope. We can trust in God. We can trust in God's love and God's care for this broken and hurting world. Those amazing things are for you, child of God, just as much as they are for the principalities, nations, and people groups of this world. Even when it feels or seems like we personally will never see what is in store for the big picture items, we can still lean into what the Spirit is calling us to do in our lives and for those around us that God calls beloved. As a Spirit-filled church, we are the hands, feet, head, and heart of Jesus Christ in all that we do. When the swords have finally been beaten down into plowshares, we are called to step in, proclaiming God's love and redemption. We proclaim that by what we do and how we do it. It isn't for selfish gain. It's for the kingdom of God. It's for the kingdom that will be built upon the ruins of human attempts to do good. 
We proclaim peace to be our ideal rather than political or military supremacy over other human beings that God also loves as a beloved child. We can proclaim the truth of God and the hope God brings us because God is behind, next to, and ahead of us. We bring the light to the darkness because through Jesus, we are the light. We are the living body of Christ that has the ability to restore and renew all things through the one who loves us best of all. Now, just because something has always been one way does not mean that it has to stay that way. Just because generations have been away from the promised land doesn't mean that it's permanent. Just because we turn on the news and see fighting every single day in the same corners of the world does not mean it has the final say. Just because our world leaders look at all of this and prattle on about just wars and similar things, it doesn't mean we have to keep solving problems this way. One of the mental images that I think about often is we go through life, hands up, holding something. Jesus said, I would rather die. Take me. Because of that sacrifice, because of that love, we can stand against the forces in this world that tell us it has to be one way, and we can say, no, no. My God of love says otherwise. Theologian Dante Stewart says, for this present moment, it's hard to find God in any of this. But if God can be found anywhere in the world, then God is found among the rubble. God is found in those who care. God is found in the middle of the heartbreak. God is found in the mind that finds it hard to find peace. God is found when doubt takes over. God is found in the anger. God is found in the living. May we, children of God, remember our wholeness in Christ as we repair the ancient ruins and point hearts towards God in an eternal hope. Amen. <laughs>